The organization I represent, uh, Reasons to Believe, really focuses on new reasons. You can see that by going to our reasons.org website. Every day we post a new scientific discovery that gives additional evidence uh, for our biblical uh, creation model. And one of the things I try to do as the president of Reasons to Believe is to put myself on uh, the non-theistic organization's mailing list just to see what they're having to say uh, about creation and the biblical creation in particular. And uh, what I've observed is that uh, they have numerous repeated complaints that they make about the intelligent design movement in general. Do I need to use this microphone? Okay. And uh, this next point, these are the five things I see repeatedly in their literature as they complain about intelligent design and intelligent design movement. They say there's no testable model, that intelligent design is not repeatable or observable, there are no predictions flowing out of intelligent design research, there's no refinement of the models, and that intelligent design tolerates provably failed uh, creation models. And uh, we heard these complaints last night, and so I'd like to try to address these complaints. I think they must be addressed if we as intelligent design theorists are to have any credibility. And uh, what I've been proposing at Reasons to Believe, along with my colleague uh, Fuzz Rana and the rest of our scholars, is that we heard last night that we have this big tent strategy in intelligent design, and several of the speakers talked about we can make the tent work better by making it bigger. And this is exactly what we're proposing, that we develop a better, bigger tent. In other words, we insist that within the intelligent design tent, Everyone must have a model, a fully developed model uh, that is testable, falsifiable, and predictive. And we need to be aggressive in developing many more models than we have so far. And to set up a free market system where they aggressively compete with one another in terms of their testability, falsifiability, and their capacity to predict future scientific and theological discoveries. And then we need to be ruthless in rejecting the failed models refine those models that are successful, see what we can do to make them better and increase their explanatory power, and then to challenge non-intelligent design models with short-range predictions. And what I mean by short-range are scientific discoveries that are likely to be forthcoming, say, within the next 6 to 24 months, so that within a period of a year or two, uh, people can tell which model is proving more successful uh, than the other models. Now, to make this work, it is critical that the different participants uh, within the intelligent design camp begin to identify the designer. Now, the designer I choose uh, for our creation model is that Jesus Christ, the creator God of the Bible, is the designer. Now, I'm willing to admit right off the bat, we cannot prove that in an absolute sense. Science can't do that. Science, for that matter, cannot pr prove in an absolute way that I exist. None of you have absolute proof that I'm speaking in front of you right now. On the other hand, I would argue that you can develop with the tools of science a probability that I'm speaking in front of you right now. And the question is, what is that probability and what kind of uncertainty do we have the fact that I exist and we can apply this to the designer? Uh, what is the probability that the designer is Jesus Christ? And then we can ask a couple of questions. Is the uncertainty about our identification of the designer, and there could be different models with different designers identified, is that uncertainty getting progressively smaller or is it getting progressively larger as scientists learn more and more about the record of nature? Then the second question, has science developed to the point where the uncertainty is small enough to eliminate the alternatives that are competing uh, with your model? Now, there are those who will argue that doesn't this violate the church-state clause, the separation of church and state? Well, I would argue that what we see in the First Amendment of our Constitution is that it guarantees the freedom of religion. It is not guaranteeing the freedom from religion. It's not a Soviet-style system where the only religion permitted is that of atheistic materialism. It's the freedom of, not the freedom from. However, the way it's been practiced is it prevents a federally supported denomination. Not at a state level, though the states have chosen to follow suit. Also, we need to note that from the very beginning of our nation, the state has always discriminated against failed religious models. 
you know, 200 years ago, you didn't see the state sponsoring uh, educational programs based on a flat earth or based on the concept that the earth was the center of the solar system rather than the sun, in spite of the fact that both concepts are loaded uh, with a lot of religious baggage. The state has always done it uh, where the evidence is overwhelming that it's a failed model. And I'm, particularly with the Supreme Court case on uh, the equal access point, they made it quite clear that access to models with scientific integrity and credibility is valid regardless of the theological implications. What you see in the four court cases of the past 50 years is the standard of measure was how credible, how valid, uh, how, what degree of integrity we see in the science that's behind uh, the religious concept. And if that's there, uh, it has access regardless of its theological implications. Therefore, I would conclude that teachers should tolerate all creation evolution models, but train students to use a scientific method to distinguish failed models from successful models. I was educated in Canada, and we did that. I mean, our teachers trained us to use a scientific method to figure out why, for example, geocentrism wasn't an acceptable hypothesis. Uh, in spite of its religious implications. And we need to recognize that the scientific method is structured in such a way that it's a brutal competition among ideas. And maybe one thing we can do within the intelligent design camp is to really strive for more brutality, uh, more competition, but to make sure that it's a free market competition, a level playing field uh, where we can actually encourage